All right, Rich Perez here with the great Dr. Joshua Colbreth. Uh, Dr. Colbreth, 1956, a magical year for you. You make the Olympics. The day of your finest hour comes. And it may not be your finest hour personally, but in the world's eyes, they're so proud of you in the United States. How do you feel this day? And was that challenge of that day any more difficult than, say, the Olympic trials? Well, there are, there are several issues here that should be discussed before that. Um, making the Olympic team for the United States of America is one of the most difficult things in the world compared to other countries. Other countries take their best athletes. They don't have to have a showdown. You have to be ready on that given day or evening or night when you have qualified for the finals of the Olympic Games in the United States. Most difficult. But I think it's a true way of democracy that we have here in our country, and I think it uh, it shows it's at its best in the Olympic trial. The night before the Olympic trial, I've talked to many of my teammates. They're gone now, but we shared how we felt the night before the Olympics. We couldn't sleep. We could tell you how many fire engines were running up and down the streets. The Olympic Games were held and lost in Los Angeles at the Coliseum, and in every little hotel. I guarantee that the Olympics that were getting ready, the guys who were getting ready to run in those finals were the same way I was. I talked to them. Some people slept on the springs of a bed. Imagine the springs, they didn't want a mattress. Some just slept on the floor. Others just put their feet up on the, on the wall. These are the crazy things that we did. We could not sleep the night before the Olympic uh, trials. That was more trying, I think, than the Olympic games itself. Making the U.S. Olympic team was the most difficult because here we, our competition would normally be from our teammates. So that's what made this so strange. And that's an amazing feat. Now Doc, you get to your race in the great Australia and tell me about the weather. How are you feeling this particular day? Was there anything you would have done differently? Of course, you came in third, a very close third winning the bronze, but you had dominated these other athletes many times over. What would you have done differently? How was the weather? How were you feeling that day? I was one of the worst days of my life because um, I had muscle spasms. I never complained because the overcast would come and then the, the sun would come out. And the, the time that, that uh, uh, you were trying to stay sharp and keep warm was a key factor. Now. In those days, we had, uh, you had to think about this. Uh, you would have a day off or two days off and come back and run in the Olympic game, Games today. What we did that, we ran on a Sunday. We ran the trial. We came back on Monday and we ran the semifinals. And one hour and 15 minutes after the semifinals, we had to be ready mentally and physically for the greatest race of our life to run the finals. We, in two days, we had to run the trials and the next day, the semi-finals and the finals. And here's, here it is, the greatest race in your life, and now you had to you had to be ready. I could not complain about any leg spasm. The worst thing that could happen was, there are eight lanes. Today, they have eight runners that make the final of the Olympic Games. Then, they had eight lanes, but six men made the finals, which was more difficult. Out of those six men, three were Americans. Where did they put me? I had one of the fastest times, like my teammates. We had the three fastest times going into the final. I had run 50.9, easing up both times in the trial and semi. Now, I'm having problems with my legs, and what lane did they put me in lane one? In lane one, the race that had been run just before that was won by the great Russian runner named Vladimir Kutch. Vladimir had just won the 5,000 meters. Everyone runs in lane one, just about, and some in lane two. But this was a dirty single track. And as a result, it was all chewed up. It looked like a beach because there you could not have any type of stability on that. I would care to be out in lane eight. I didn't care anything but lane one because you had two full turns to run. My teammates were like in lanes three and four. And if they had put me in eight, I would have been delighted, but they didn't. So I had two turns to negotiate. And when the gun went off, I ran, but I found myself in last position at the seventh hurdle, which is crucial. It's about 300 meters and you got another 100 meters to go. 
With that, I knew I had to do something. It went through my mind, everything, as I charged down the back, down the, around the eighth to ninth hurdle because my teammates, Eddie Southern and Glenn Davis, were gone. And as a result, as I approached, I started closing the gap. And over the ninth hurdle, I made a bid for it. The tenth hurdle, I had Potgieter from South Africa, Dave Lee from Australia, Yuri Litvinov of Russia. And with that tenth hurdle, I do not gamble. I make sure I clear it because that's a, a like a ten thousand dollar insurance policy. When you're tired and you take it too low, it's a mishap. Well, I made sure I took the hurdle high. It was close between Potgieter and myself from South Africa, and I cleared the hurdle. Potgieter nipped the hurdle and went down, but I could see him going down from me being in lane one. But as I proceeded in, I came in third behind my teammate, uh, Glenn Davis, setting a little uh, tiny Olympic record that Eddie Southern had, had run 50.2 in a trial heat. I came in third, much slower than what I had run in the two races previously though, but I was very thankful to God that I was able to get third, make it the first clean sweep of the Olympic Games of America, one, two, three, and believe me, when I went to that podium and those three flags went up, and I was in the Marine Corps, the only Marine that was on the U.S. Olympic track and field team, and I was told by the Commandant of the Marine Corps, when I stood on the podium, he said that I was the only one standing tall, because you know, when you put your index finger in the seam of your, your trousers, that is standing tall as a Marine. I had my bronze medal in one hand, and the other hand was the index finger was in the seam of my sweatsuit. Gung ho, I was. Tremendous, Dr. Josh. And I'll tell you what, everybody that I have been associated with around you, very proud of you. It's been a fantastic, fantastic athletic achievement that you have accomplished throughout your career. And I want to thank you because the American people need to know your story. You have great, great, absolute true stories with many of the great runners, Jesse Owens, uh, the great... Uh, Wilma Rudolph, and I mean, we can go on and on. Wilma Rudolph, we had Willoughby White, Johnny Woodruff, Ira Murchison, Lou Jones. Uh, I mean, you had Perry O'Brien, Al Order, I can name them endlessly. Tommy Kono, the great. Tommy so. Kono, one of the great <laughs> all time. Well, I tell you, Doc, it's been a pleasure. I know the people of Las Vegas love you out here. I know Pennsylvania, they love, they're very proud of you in Pennsylvania. I know they love you in Atlanta, Georgia, all the states, all the United States. I've taken him to Hawaii. He's been a great inspiration to all of us. Dr. Josh, continued success. We are a, with a national treasure in you, and I thank you. I appreciate it, Richard. Thank you. All right, Rich Perez, Dr. Joshua Culbreth, Las Vegas, Nevada. Today is June. 26, 2008. Thank you.